Civil War, many of the Plains Indians were moved to Oklahoma. There's a place in the middle of North America with a story that you should know about. It's not the one about the violent dust that pushed people out, or the novel about a homicide and a drought, or the songs and dances about rivalries between farmers and cowboys. It's the story of what happened before all of this. The story of checkerboard maps and lines and private property and broken promises. All because of this. This place was a dumping ground for the people that the US government wanted to get rid of. Which is why today it has the second highest number of first Americans of any state. It was once a random rectangle that the US government used to ship native populations after they removed them with a new weapon of state power. Paperwork, treaties and payments and spreadsheets, pretend justice. That's the story we talked about in part one. The next part is how these first Americans created a state of their own, fighting against their captors to retain one last shred of sovereignty over their land, the land that had been taken from them over and over again. A frontier people had remade a continent, the United States of America. Hey, before we go on, let me tell you something disturbing, kind of, which is I recently learned that my name and all of my personal details were on a people search list. It's just one of many sides of this massive shadowy market of data brokers who collect loads of information about all of us and then sell it to companies so that they can market to us. The reason I'm telling you all of this is because it has to do with the sponsor of today's video, Incogni. I'm very happy that Incogni exists. You sign up and you give them permission to go out on your behalf to take you off of these lists. We have privacy rights that entitle us to not be on these lists, but it's really complicated and bureaucratic to actually do it. And there are dozens and dozens of these lists. So instead, Incogni does it for you. I've been signed up for Incogni for a few months now, and it is so satisfying. You have this dashboard that shows you all of the lists that they found you on, and then they show you the status of each one, the efforts that they're taking to get you off this list. And then the best part is they show you the list that you have been successfully taken off of. If you wanna try this out, there's a link in my description. It is incogni.com slash Johnny Harris. When you click that link, it helps support this channel, but it also gets you in on a full refund within 30 days if you decide that this service isn't for you. Thank you Incogni for helping me out here and also for sponsoring today's video. Let's dive back into the story. Okay, so remember in part one, I showed you how the US government used bureaucracy and a particularly horrible law to push out over 100,000 people, to push them off their land, many of them ending up here in a little rectangle that the US called Indian Territory. And crucially, in the process of kicking these nations off their land, the US government promised that they would leave them alone, that they could live in peace, rebuild their lives, relearn their land. So over the course of the 1800s, more and more tribes are exiled and arrive here to Indian territory. The territory gets divided again and again as these tribes are crammed into this one rectangle, which results in this map. And a reminder that each of these nations had their own government and culture and language, and yet they were all dumped in this one place and labeled Indian. So they ended up here knowing that it would be hard, but okay, at least we can rebuild a new life without the anxiety of white settlers unfairly claiming our land. Oops, nope, here they come. The westward movement was like a great tidal wave, sweeping westward past the Mississippi River. Over in the east, the Americans had now convinced themselves that it was their literal destiny to keep spreading west. And as they're doing so, they stumble upon this rectangle, this rectangle that they thought they would never reach. But no, they're not allowed to settle here because it's allocated for Indians by treaties, like real ironclad treaties. Okay, but wait, here in the center of this map, you see this little section, what does that say? Here, let's look at a different map. Oh, unassigned land. Let's settle here. When the land was thrown open to white settlers. And by settle, I mean, not like buy the land or sign anything, just show up to this empty looking flat area and just settle. Soon these imperial squatters are farming the land. They're building a life, a society in the West, but right in the heart of the territory that the US government had signed treaties 
promising to first Americans. Oh, and by the way, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. Maps around this time start to show this weird little panhandle that doesn't make any sense. Literally called no man's land because nobody really claimed it. And then a bunch of criminals started living here because there was no law. Anyway, someday I'll go into that one. We're talking about Indian territory, and word soon gets out that this place is the new trendy part of town. The federal government is kind of hesitant, like, wait a minute, we had promised these people this land, like, let's just back off. But the squatters kept coming and clamoring, and soon there was a railroad that was built that went right through here, bringing even more settlers. And finally, the government was like, fine. You can move in and settle in this one little section of unassigned land in the middle of Indian territory. But it's gonna be first come, first serve, and so we'll make it a race? Yes, a race. Like literally there was a race. There was a starting line and there was a gunshot and 50,000 settlers hungry for new land in covered wagons dashed forth to claim some of this 2 million acres of unassigned land in hopes of getting cheap property and starting a new life. The tidal wave of Europeans continues. They're hearing about these mystically huge plots of land in the West, the American dream. As unassigned land started to fill up, the settlers started to look around at all of this land that, yeah, technically had been promised to the natives, but they weren't really using it to farm. So like, no harm if we just sort of set up shop here, right? So they kind of start doing this and the government has to get involved. So in 1890, they draw this line. It cuts Indian territory in half, leaving all of this, as well as the random no man's land panhandle, to become a new territory. They would call it Oklahoma. So Indian territory now is just this land for the five civilized tribes. That's what the federal government called them. But all the tribes that had lived here were now in the new territory of Oklahoma and their land was suddenly up for grabs. And once again, here come the maps and the documents and all the stuff that basically made this feel like it was official and right. A lot of these maps have squares on them. Look at these squares, perfectly checkered squares. All of these squares, these checkerboard maps, show us how differently European settlers and their government saw the world than the natives. The concepts of communal land use and lack of personal property that tribes abided by was considered backwards and uncivilized. From the European view, they're not using the land productively, so we need to create a system of grids and plots and land titles to get the most out of this land. This process of drawing a bunch of squares on the land that had formerly been promised to natives was called allotment. And it meant taking tribal territory like this and drawing a bunch of straight lines to make it a massive grid. And then they would find out where native families were living and allow them to stay there. But everything else was up for grabs. The signal was given and the race was on. And here come more of those weird races, four more in fact, each bringing in floods of settlers into this land that had been promised by treaty to somebody else. And look, these maps start to fill up with names. Alice, Roy, Julia Delage has this square. These are people coming from Europe looking for the American dream and finding maps full of squares and land to claim allotment. This real estate boom came with a marketing boom as well. Indian land for sale. Get a home of your own. Easy payments. Possession within 30 days. And look, they're advertising that here in 1911 that they have 350,000 acres available for sale. There is so much land up for grabs. It was the same thing as before, what we talked about in the first video, but just happening again in a different place by different people. It was maps and documents and bureaucracy cutting down native sovereignty and culture square by square. With all of this carving up, settlers start outnumbering the indigenous people. The five tribes were still technically safe from all of this allotment for a time, but they saw what was coming. They had learned time and time again that the United States government, for all of their treaties and promises, never actually kept the agreements that they signed. And they were right. Soon, there was a law passed that said that all tribal governments and tribal courts would be abolished by 1906. So as a last ditch effort to fight back, the five tribes gathered and devised a plan to salvage some shred of their sovereignty.
This was a time when US territories were making proposals to be states, and new states were popping up left and right. So if these tribes wanted to band together and make a state of their own, this was their time. They called the state Sequoia, in honor of the man who created the Cherokee writing system. And so the year before all the tribal governments were to be abolished by law, the tribes held the Sequoia Constitutional Convention, where hundreds of spectators gathered to watch the delegates create and write a constitution, complete with a bill of rights, trade regulations, tax policy, county borders, and by the end of it, they had produced this 35,000 word document separated into 18 articles, 270 sections, that had everything they needed for a proper state. It was unanimously ratified, and in a public vote, overwhelmingly endorsed by the citizens in Indian territory. And honestly, if you read this document, it's kind of a story. From the population, to the economy, to education and taxable wealth, they deserve to be a state. But then they appealed to the humanity of the government that had done so much harm to their people, their culture, and their home. They appealed to this, quote, natural right of people to govern themselves, quote, by the fact that we constitute a separate and distinct community from any on earth with a different history, associations, and ideals and hopes. These people had been boxed out time and time again, and now they were appealing to the values of these Europeans who had taken their land using their language and their legal tools to make the case for their statehood. Okay, so now with their well-formulated constitution, their solid proposal, their maps, all of it in hand, the tribal leaders went to Washington, ready to lobby for a state. And Congress didn't even look at the proposal. Like they didn't even look at the, like they didn't even like look at it. It wasn't like a debate. It's just like, they just were like, no, of course not, not. It was like dead on arrival. First, just because of plain old politics. The Republican majority at the time didn't want a state that would mean more senators and congressmen for Democrats. Something that Republican President Teddy Roosevelt especially didn't like. It was also about resources. Sequoia had oil and farmland that Oklahoma Territory didn't have. They weren't gonna let the native people have like all these resources. But in addition to this, many white lawmakers didn't like the idea of a state run by brown people. So the proposal died. Sequoia never became a state. If there was going to be a state, there could only be one. And indeed, two years later, a new map was drawn. All of this land that was going to be Sequoia was swallowed into a new state, the 46th, Oklahoma. But of course, they wouldn't throw away all the work that these tribes had put into Sequoia's constitution, so they just sort of took it for themselves. The Oklahoma constitution is basically word for word what was written in Sequoia's constitution. One historian called it, quote, the ultimate cut and paste job. So this is what Oklahoma looks like. And they reserved one small chunk for the native people to govern themselves up here. So just as a quick recap, time lapse of the whole thing, remember that first Americans, the people who had lived here for thousands of years, went from roaming freely around all of this to being driven out and dumped into this rectangle and then eventually cut in half and then gridded up square by square and sold, to then being further reduced to this. Today, there are 39 recognized tribal nations in Oklahoma, but just one of them has a reservation. Now listen, this is one little shred of the history of the people who lived on this land. This same process happened all over the country as Europeans moved to every corner of the continent. After First Americans were boxed out and lied to and relocated, the United States government eventually settled on this. This is a map from 2020 that shows every federally recognized reservation. There are 326 of them. But remember that this number leaves out the tribes that we talked about in this story. But then later that year, 2020, something big happened. A Supreme Court ruling found that the treaties that the U.S. had signed with the Muscogee, Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminole, and Chickasaw nations, promising that they would leave them alone in Oklahoma, those were legitimate treaties. And that those treaties had been broken when the U.S. government just drew all of them into the state of Oklahoma. And thus, all of this land that was set aside for the five tribes during the whole relocation was in fact still tribal land. So what does that mean? Well, what it means at first is that 
Google Maps shows these borders, these borders that we've been looking at, these borders from the treaties in the late 1800s. But if nothing else, it makes crystal clear how much of a charade all of this justice was back in the day, all of the treaties, all of the legal processes. It was all pretend. It was a sterilized version of the classical imperialism that these Europeans had kind of fled from. And yet it was incredibly effective. I mean, the very way that I have had to tell this story is proof of how effective it is. How our government policy successfully created the concept of Native American, of Indian. Hundreds, if not thousands of different peoples with unique cultures, languages, and histories, and relationships to this land, all lumped into one category on a spreadsheet, drawn into boxes, the perfect place to continue to whittle away at their distinct identities, to erase their story, one broken treaty at a time. Hey everyone, um, so this topic is way bigger than I could ever do in this video and um, I've struggled with it for a lot of years. In fact, when I was at Vox, I was going to do a whole Borders series on um, reservations and First Americans and it just felt too complicated to dive into and I've been struggling with that. So this, this, this and the previous video are my attempts to broach this history, try to understand it, try to be sensitive to it while also um, aware of how little we can do in a short video like this. So if you have other stories that need to be told on this, please let me know um, because I, I want to know and I want to cover more. Um, I just want to tell you about a couple of things. Number one, something I'm really excited about is that we have a giant map poster that I designed with some help from my amazing team. and. It is a poster of all of the map projections, not all of them, dozens of them, uh, with a little explainer on why all maps are wrong, which is something I've been thinking about for years. So go check it out. It is a way you can support our channel while also having a cool poster uh, about maps in your room. Another way you can support around here is the newsroom. The newsroom is our Patreon. It just sounds way cooler to call it the newsroom, and so we call it the newsroom. It is a place where you can go and support us while also getting a couple of cool perks like an extra video every month you get an extra video which is a behind the scenes of how we do what we do here we have a big team of people very talented fun interesting funny people that appear in the behind the scenes vlog that publishes to newsroom members you get access to royalty free music from our composer tom fox and you get the warm fuzzy feeling in your belly that you are supporting independent journalism um, so go check that out. It's in patreon.com slash Johnny Harris. Also, I started a company a few years ago called Bright Trip. Um, it's where we do smart travel education, brighttrip.com. We have LUTs and presets that help color our videos and photos. Uh, and I think that's all the things I need to tell you about. So thank you all for being here and for your ongoing support for everyone who comments and it is a conversation that we are in all of the time as we read your comments and hear your support, hear your generosity. We will see you in the next one.